there is a deep union between close union between Christ and the believer such that it is enough if you believe Christ has the power that is enough plus you believe in addition to that that you are united joined together with Christ in close union and that will help you to believe that you've got the power Oh God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come, our shelter from the stormy blast, and our eternal hope. Power means not that narrow understanding of power which says power is just muscle power or some brute force. No. There are different kinds of powers, right? The basic meaning of power is ability, right? The ability to do something. Great. That's power. The ability to reach your goal. The ability to go where you want to go, do what you want to do, be the kind of person you want to be. That is power. That's what I'm talking about. And I'm saying how much power does the believer have if you want to fulfill the plan and purpose for uh, which God has for you, you need a lot of power, right? And your own power is not enough. You need the power of God, right? To live a victorious life, you need, a, you need the power of God. The truth of the New Testament, the teaching of the New Testament is that God has already given the believer power, right? That's what the New Testament teaches. Paul very systematically teaches that. The believer has already been given power, we don't have to pray to God saying, God, give us power, right? Lord, give us anointing, give us power, pour out your power. No, he has already poured it out. <laughs> it is already waiting for you in your bank account. It is ready for you to use. It is a ready power. It's available to you for you to use. You just have to take it by faith and experience it. The believer has already been given power. God has already given us power. How much power has he given us? Well, let's go back to our main passage, uh, Ephesians 1.19, right? Paul says, God has given us resurrection power. Everybody say, resurrection power. Now, we are talking about Christ's resurrection, not some other resurrection, right? You remember the power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead? That is no ordinary power. Like I said last week, Christ did not raise himself up. If you think like that, you will think there was no power manifest there. No great power was needed. That's how you'll think. 
Like, there was just nothing. Christ rose up on the third day. That's all. No, wrong. Christ was dead and gone. He was in the grave, my friend. He had no power of his own. That is why the New Testament never says Christ rose up himself. No, no. It was the Father who raised him up. In some places it says it was the Spirit who raised him up. In some places they combine it and it says the Father through the power of the Spirit raised up Jesus from the dead. Very important to understand that simple truth because that Without that, all this will not make sense. See. So a great amount of power was required to raise up Jesus from the dead. A great amount of power was manifest there. Last week we talked about how great that power is. You know, uh, it is greater than man's greatest power. Uh, it is greater than even other acts of God. You know, even, you see, God's power is manif- has been manifest in various ways, in various places, in various times, Right? Uh, but God doesn't show the same amount of power everywhere or the same kind of power everywhere. Different places manifest differently, right? We are saying in all of history, never was there power manifest like it was manifest on the resurrection day. Like you saw it on the resurrection day, all of history, they never saw the power of God manifest in that way. So in such a great way. You see, we look at the Old Testament and we think, you know, the power that was manifest when God split open the Red Sea. Now, that's some power we think, right? We think of that as great power. Now, that is great power, right? How often do you see the sea split like this and stand up like this, like a wall, and people walk through it, and then an entire army drown in the sea when it comes back down? You don't see that happen. That is some amazing power. I'm not denying it. Last week when I said it, I was not trying to say that is no power at all. You know, I remember I said shadow power. I was not, my point was, no, that was not a great power. No, no, that is a very, very great power. But when you compare that to the power that was displayed on that resurrection day, it is nothing. (laughs) When you compare the Red Sea power with the Christ's resurrection power, which is greater, clearly Christ's resurrection power is greater. That's what, that's all I'm trying to say. Same way, when you compare Christ's resurrection power with Lazarus' resurrection power, which is greater, we look at Lazarus and we are astonished by that, you know, fourth day resurrection. But that is nothing compared to the power that was displayed at Christ's resurrection. I showed you why. You know, more than all this, even when you compare the power that was displayed in creation, the power of the resurrection is still greater, is still better. (laughs) See, you have to understand, in Jesus' God's full attributes are on full display. (laughs) Like nowhere else. Now, I know the Old Testament is amazing, right? Just the Old Testament by itself is amazing. But guess what? The New Testament is even more amazing. (laughs) That's the truth, right? Without Jesus, you cannot tell me, you know, it's equal. No, it's not equal. Jesus is the glory of the Father. That's where you see the Father's power and love and everything else in its full display, in its maximum display. Take the cross, for example. The cross is where you see the love of God in its fullest, in its most perfect display, right? You see the love of God in many other cases. In the Old Testament, God shows his love to the people of Israel. But do you see it like you see it on the cross? No. The cross is the peak, right? That's where God shows his love the most, you can say. He displays his love in the most glorious fashion. He gives his own son, gave him up for us all, to be beaten, to be stricken, to be wounded, to die. He gave him up. Where else do you see God's love like that? Nowhere else, not even in the Bible. The cross is the peak display of God's love. In the same way, the resurrection of Christ is the most glorious display of God's love power. You cannot see power like anywhere like you can see it in the resurrection. Now it's not just an, you know, it's not just raising up Christ. That's not all. No, no. We read in that passage, Ephesians 1, right? He raised him up. Let's go back there, Ephesians 1, 19. What is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him up from the dead. But that's not all. That's just the beginning. See? And seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality. He goes on and on. The power did not just raise him up. Yes, it raised him up. It gave him life. It gave him a new body. But then it took him all the way to the heavenly places, it says, right? And seated him at the right hand of God. What does that mean? Heavenly places means right at the top, right? Heavenly places are not here. It's a, I don't want to get into that. But it basically means the top of the universe, right? top in terms of power, in terms of authority and everything. Jesus who was down there in the bottom in the grave was raised up by this power and this power took him all the way to the top 
and seated him at the right hand of God, it says. The right hand of God is like the top of the top. <laughs> okay, you are already in the heavenly places. In the heavenly places, the right hand of God is like the maximum you can go. It is the number two position, my friend. Next to God the Father, the right hand of God is the number two position in terms of power, in terms of authority, in terms of glory, in terms of majesty, in terms of respect and honor and everything. It's the number two position. This power took him all the way from down there to all the way there to the right hand of God. The right hand of God also symbolizes rulership. Right? The person is, who is at the right hand of God rules along with God, reigns along with God. Today we say Jesus is Lord, right? He's ruling and reigning. Where is he? He's at the right hand of God ruling and reigning. How did he get there? It was this power. And it doesn't stop there. Paul says he put all things under his feet. Verse 22, right? This one power did all that. See, when I say resurrection power, I don't mean just he rose from the dead. No, no. It's all that. I'm just using a shorthand, saying it's short, resurrection power. But it's one power which raised him, took him all the way to the top, made him sit at the right hand, put all things under his feet. What are the all things? In verse 21, Paul clarifies, far above all principality, power, might, and dominion, every name that is named, not only in this age to come, but also in that which is to, not only in this age, but that which is to come. This power took him all the way there and then subjected everything under his control, put everything under him. Every other great power is under Christ. Today, Christ is Lord, right? Jesus is Lord, not uh, some other person, you know. Some people may look powerful out in the world, but they are not Lord, my friend. We don't call them Lord. Christ only is Lord. They are all under the feet of Christ, you see. That's the meaning. Paul was writing this during the time of the Roman government, okay? And he's saying, Jesus is Lord, every, every other power is under his feet. That means, what does he mean? Rome is also under, that's what he means. <laughs> See, it's not an ordinary matter. I don't want to say more explicitly than that. I hope you know what I mean. Everything, everybody, every other power is under the feet of Christ today. Christ reigns supreme as Lord over all. What is the power which made him go all the way there and made him reign? It is that resurrection power, Right? Not just raised him up, but took him all the way there, made him to rule and reign over everything. That is what we mean when we say resurrection power. Now let me ask you, it's not just that Christ experienced that power 2,000 years ago. Last week I said Christ, you know, that power went into him 2,000 years ago. But let me ask you, does Christ have resurrection power today? Yes. Let me ask you a series of questions, right? And think about it before you answer it. Christ is living today. Yes, Christ rose again 2,000 years ago, but he's still living today. All right? If he's living today, then with what power is he living today? What power is making him to live today, keeping him alive? It's that same power. Why? If that power never went into him, he would have never rose again. He would have never started living at all. And he would not be alive even today. If that power never went into him, he would still be in the grave, you see. The only reason he is alive today is that power went into him, caused him to live on that day, but it is still, that same power is still keeping Christ alive. I'm talking about such a great power, okay? If Christ is, you know, that power made Christ to rule and reign on that day, took him to the right hand of God. But let me ask you, is Christ ruling and reigning today? Yes, if he is doing that, then what power is making him to rule and reign today? With what power is he ruling and reigning today? With what power is everything remaining under his feet today? 2015, it is the same. Resurrection, power, right? It made him to rule and reign that day, 2,000 years ago, put everything under his feet 2,000 years ago, but till today it is making him rule and reign and till today everything is under his feet. Not only today, Christ will live forevermore, right? Will Christ die again like Lazarus? No. <laughs> he will live forevermore. Now let me ask you, with what power will he live forevermore? What is the power that will continue to keep him alive forever and ever and ever? What is the power? That same, that power went into him that day. It has been working ever since. The effect of that has never diminished it will continue, it will last forever and ever. Not just keep him alive, but keep him ruling and reigning. Keep, continue to keep everything under his feet, you see. 
Such a great power you can never see anywhere else in the Bible even. Okay, this is it. This is the peak, all right? So, let me ask you, does Christ have resurrection power today? Yes, that's obvious, right? Everybody, everybody will believe that. Now let me ask you, does the believer have resurrection power today in 2015? <laughs> now that's where it gets hard to. It's not hard to believe that Christ has the resurrection power today. Now that's very easy to be. Anybody will believe that. Yes, he is Christ, you know. But Paul is not saying just Christ has the power. No, no, he's saying the same power Christ has today, the believer has Today, that's what Paul is saying, you see. Now, that's where it gets hard to believe. See? We have the same power today. You can easily accept that Christ has resurrection power today, but to accept that you have resurrection power, now that's something else, you see. First of all, you may say, why so much power? Okay, I understand Christ needed so much power to get him out of the grave and take him all the way there, to put everything under his feet and to make him to rule and reign. All that is, you know, a lot of power is needed for all that. But for my life... So much power is, first of all, not needed, you may think. <laughs> Why so much power? <laughs> Later on, I want to talk about what to do with all this power, right? But now itself, I'll give you a preliminary answer. If you're asking why so much power, you know what the answer is? God wants you to have so much victory. <laughs> That's the answer, my friend. <laughs> See, we have underestimated how much God wants for us. That's the problem. <laughs> we have underestimated how far we should go. Right? We have, you know, said, oh, this is enough. I was living a worthless life. God has saved me. God has blessed me. I have already come a long way. This is more than enough. I will be thankful to God for all eternity for keeping me like this today. For where I am today. We think like that, you see. We think this is enough. But God says, no, no, I have greater things for you to do. I have farther places for you to go. I have more difficult things for you to accomplish, my friend. Things which you cannot do without this resurrection power. We're going to talk about that later. Okay. <laughs> but, you know, when we are tested, you know, when failure comes and when discouragement comes, what happens? We begin, begin to doubt that we have this power, right? You know what my life is like? You're telling me I have resurrection power. I don't even have the power to sleep, you know. Sleep itself is not coming. You're talking about resurrection power, you know. <laughs> Sometimes, you know, when we're going through problems and difficulties, it becomes hard to believe something so high, something so great as what Paul is telling us here, right? So that's why we need to get into this truth deeper. We need to have a deeper knowledge of this truth. What we're going to do today is that we're going to get into this deeper so that our roots go deeper into this, see? Today, what we're going to do, what I'm going to do is, I'm going to teach you another truth, okay? It's related, but it's a, another truth. If you understand and accept what I'm going to teach you today, what I'm going to present to you today, then it will make it easier for you to believe that you've got the same power that Christ has today. Okay, you got it? Today, we're going to deal with a related truth, which if you understand, it will make it much easier for you to believe that you've got the same power that Christ has today. What is that truth? That truth is union with Christ. Union with Christ. What does that mean? We are united to Christ or we are joined to Christ. We are, there is a connection between Christ and us. The connection is such that it is a union kind of unity means one, right? Uni means one. So the connection is such that you and Christ are so joined together in such a way that you are really one, right? You can't separate Christ and the believer. Because of such a close connection, it is enough for the power to be in Christ, it will automatically come to, you know what I mean? I mean, I'm not just trying to make this easier for you, play some gimmick or something. This is right out of it, the same passage, right? Go to Ephesians 1 verse 23. Paul considers union with Christ very important and he gives a lot of importance to this teaching in these two chapters because that is in the mind of Paul. That is why Paul is able to believe we've got resurrection power. See, that's the thing. I want to show you that. Paul in his mind has this truth about union with Christ right here when he's writing these two chapters. Ephesians 1, 23 or 22 and 23. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church 
which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in. Notice what he's saying. He's saying Christ is the head and the church is his body. Christ is the head and the believers are his body. Individually, you individually also you can take it. Christ is the head and you are like Christ's body. You are joined to Christ like a head is joined to a... Right? So that means... Is the blood running in the head also running in the body? Right? Yes. Or does the head have a different blood group or something? You have different blood running there? No. The head has the same. It's the same blood, right? <laughs> so that basically that's what Paul is saying. You are like the body. Christ is like the head. The connection is so close, so deep, so intimate that if the head has power, it will come to the body. It cannot be without coming to the that's basically what we are trying to say in today's message, okay? There is a deep union between, close union between Christ and the believer such that it is enough if you believe Christ has the power, that is enough, plus you believe, in addition to that, that you are united, joined together with Christ in close union, and that will help you to believe that you've got the power, okay? Now, I, I don't want to just, uh, I'm not taking this up just because it's something that makes it easier, that's not my goal, to give you something easy. No, no. My goal as a preacher is to preach the truth of the word, right? I want to show you that in this passage, Paul is dominated by this truth of union with Christ. He's fully thinking of this. Go to Ephesians 1.3, right? Just the same passage, we're going to look at the context, okay? Ephesians 1.3. I want you to notice how many times Paul says, in Christ, in him, right? That is signifying union, right? We are in Christ. Things are in Christ. Right? Look at Ephesians 1.3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. So like he said, God has already given us power. He's saying here, God has already blessed us with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Notice what, what he's saying. In Christ. Now we all understand that, right? All the blessings are in Christ, through Christ. Christ only did everything and got the blessings. And they're all in Christ, Right? Everybody knows that. So Paul says every blessing is in Christ. Now he continues from verse 4 and now he starts to list the specific blessings that are in Christ. Okay? Now watch what he does. Verse 4. Just as he chose us, choosing us is a blessing, in him. Notice that. In. See, just now Paul said every blessing is in Christ. Now that is enough. Now he could have said, listen believer, every blessing is in Christ. Now let me tell you a list of the blessings that are. He could have done that. But I want you to see every time he will keep on repeating. Okay. He chose us in him. Verse 4. Right. And then verse 5. Predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ. Now that's by. Right. Related to in but it's not in. Look at verse uh, 6. He made us accepted in the beloved. Are you seeing this? In the Beloved is who? Christ. He's talking about Christ as the... He accepted us, it seems. See, Paul could have said, God accepted us. That's enough. It's understood he accepted us in Christ only. But he wants to say, in the beloved. Verse 7. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. See, everybody knows that redemption and the forgiveness of sins is through Jesus only. You don't have to say it is in him. Do you have to say? No. Especially Paul, after saying it so many times, does not have to say, every believer will know that redemption is in Christ only. But Paul repeats it, in him. Look at verse 11. In him also we have obtained an inheritance. Verse 13. In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. In whom? Right? Verse um, then you come to the end of the chapter and Paul says, well, you, so long he's been saying you are in him, blessings are in him, everything is in him, everything was done to you in him, everything you received, every blessing in him. Now he says, he's the head and you are the body. You are so connected with him. Look at chapter 2, chapter 2, verse 5. We, even when we were dead in trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. Together with, right? He doesn't have to say it. Yes, it's understood. Why does he have to say it? Verse 6, and raised us up together is it necessary so many times Paul are you really aren't you getting a little irritating and made us sit together in the heavenly places in I'm reading verse 6 in Christ Jesus Paul just overdoes it again and again verse 
7, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Are you tired of me doing this? Verse 10, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. Verse 11, at one time uh, you were Gentiles in the flesh. Verse 12, at that time you were without Christ. Verse 12. Then verse 13, look at verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, you once were far off have been brought near. And then from verse 20 onwards, Paul talks about how God is building a building with Jesus Christ as the cornerstone, with the apostles as the foundation. And then he's building you one on top of the other, all the believers, one building that also you are built on Christ. <laughs> That is, what I'm trying to say is in these two chapters, the thing that is occupying Paul's mind the most, dominating his mind the most, the truth that he is thinking about the most as he's writing Ephesians 1 and 2, is that the believer is in Christ. Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King. His love endures forever. For he is good, he is above all things. His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise. With a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, his love endures forever. For the life that's been reborn. Love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise, sing praise, sing praise, sing praise. Forever God is faithful. Forever God is strong. Forever God is. God, we will carry on. Everybody. Love and just forever.